Aloha Oina La. I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, live streaming Fridays at 3 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. Next week, Wednesday, June 21st, is the 2017 summer solstice, the day with the most hours of sunlight in the whole year. To celebrate, my guest is Stuart Scott, Executive Director of the United Planet Faith and Science Initiative and a well-known figure in the international climate change orbit. I've asked him to share some of what he's experienced talking to Pope Francis at the Vatican, at the COP22 Marrakesh Climate Change Conference, and most recently, Washington DC's March for Science. In particular, what are the latest interventions for dealing with the United States' new ice age of reason? Welcome back, Stuart. Thank you very much, Kelly. I'm very glad to be here again. So you have uh, characteristically logged many miles <laughs> uh, since I, I last chatted with you. Um, so uh, that, that's the contradiction in my existence, right? You want to just say a word about that? I, I um, my carbon footprint for the flying I have to do is huge, um, I, but I try to subject every decision I make about travel, about flying to whether or not it's, it's worth the carbon in the long run. The money is secondary, whether or not it's worth the carbon. That's beautiful. OK, so the last trek you did, or that I know about, was the Washington, D.C. Science March. Well, that was one part of it, actually. This is the, the first time in my life I've made a, a circuit ar around the world, because I started out going to Southeast Asia and then was asked to do a presentation in Helsinki, Finland. So. I ended okay. up completing a circuit. So, uh, so what was what made that march worth worth the carbon? Well, I was already on the East Coast. I had it in my calendar, the uh, March for Science, and a week later, the uh, People's Climate March. And I said, if I'm anywhere nearby, for on one of those two uh, weekends, I'm going to go. So, what made it worth going? Wait, wait. Yeah, what made it worth what, going to the climate What made march? it worth the carbon was we currently have a, uh, a, an administration, a presidential administration that is um, either really pretty dumb or feigning uh, ignorance in order to promote economic interests where they will into their own pockets in some cases. So one of the things that we're um, uh, both big fans of is changing this conversation t from climate, focusing on the climate, yes. to focusing on the economic reality. I love to quote uh, Bill Clinton for a, a reason other than he um, intended. He used to, he's famous for having said, it's the economy, stupid. Well, it's the economy, but in the opposite sense that he meant it. He believes in economic growth. Most of the world, we've been handed economic growth will solve all problems, all boats float, etc. Well, there's a possibility that we have already gotten too big, that the human economy is bigger than the planet we live on can support. So the way I see it, we're in an age or a, a transition that's similar to when Galileo said the Earth is round and the Vatican said, no, the Earth is flat or we will agree with us or we will excommunicate you. We're going through another paradigm shift from the Earth is infinite to the Earth is finite. And it's the same kind of paradigm shift, but this time the Vatican's on our side. The Vatican's on our side. Let's, let's, um, you got to speak with the Pope. We, we, we yes. have uh, Pope Francis. How did, what did he say? What happened? Tell us. Well, I can't tell you how much work it took to get 15 seconds with the Pope. The gentleman who's behind us in, uh, at that moment is the, uh, the next president of the International Society for Ecological Economics. I'd like your audience to remember the term ecological economics. We might survive if we had that in place. The woman who came after me was the wife of the ambassador from Argentina to Costa Rica, the most environmental nation on earth, perhaps. Costa Rica? Costa Rica is, it, they are very, very conscious of, of the environment. They are very good. Bhutan and Costa Rica, I don't know which I would say is wow, e fascinating. environmentally. The, okay. Now, the Pope, Pope is from Argentina. So ah. I was going to the Vatican 
with the next president of the Society for Ecological Economics to try to foster a collaboration between the Holy See and ecological economics. And the woman, uh, as I said, the wife of the uh, uh, ambassador, spoke with me for an hour while we waited for the Pope to show up. And now she's essentially helping try to uh, firm up that marriage, that, that uh, rapprochement <laughs> between the Vatican and, and ecological economics. OK. Uh, so there's um, another reason Pope Francis was important to you, right? You've yes. been working really hard on this yes. initiative. Um, so let's he, talk about uh, about that a little bit. Okay. So uh, he was he he said something. We have a, a quote from him that. Um, oh, there we go. Now this is a very short quote out of a document that's called uh, Laudato Si, which is uh, Latin for "Praised be you." Uh, it's the first two words of a, a prayer. Uh, attributed to St. Francis, the Pope's namesake. Um, and it's a very interesting document. It's 75 or 80 pages of an indictment of the present economic system, which he calls the technocratic paradigm, um, for trashing humanity and trashing the planet. Wow. Now, he doesn't say it that way. That's my Brooklyn slang. <laughs> but this quote will give you an idea. Given the insatiable and irresponsible growth produced over many decades, we need also to think of containing growth by setting some reasonable limits and even retracing our steps before it's too late. It's all right there. It's all right there. So he is one of um, three uh, persons or entities yeah. who you are proposing for, or you're part of the, the uh, group proposing okay. for the, the Nobel uh, Prize in Sustainable Development. Okay, now that you, you just made the, the mistake that I have to uh, okay. explain to people a lot. It's a Nobel Peace Prize. I'm promoting a particular Nobel Peace Prize and the Pope is one of the three nominees. Now it's a, it's a Peace Prize that's themed for sustainable development just as the 2007 prize that went to Al Gore and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in that case it was themed for climate. This one is themed for sustainable development, but it is not a new prize. It's, it would take a huge, huge... Uh, okay. okay, all right, okay. <laughs> Can't We're, do a new prize. Okay, so, <laughs> so one of three, yeah. so we have the Pope, mm -hmm. um, and who else do we have? Okay. Well, the, the, you can nominate up to three individuals or organizations to share a Peace Prize. The um, organization, the Club of Rome, is the first uh, nominee. And the Club of Rome uh, is a, a think tank, shall we say, of uh, concerned individuals, individuals who've been concerned for decades about the unsustainable directions of humanity. And they sponsored a... Uh, a study that came out of MIT was published in 1972 called The Limits to Growth, which is bedrock. It is the foundation of the sustainability movement. If you look at scholarly literature, most of it goes back to cites that document. So the Club of Rome had the foresight and wisdom to commission that report, The Limits to Growth. Um, it's still a classic in its field. It's the most published, the most uh, printed environmental title to date. Wow. Uh, and there's a new one you showed. Yes. A, there's, a, uh, well, there was the 1972 version, and then they updated it in, in 2003 to see how the modeling they did was tracking reality. Uh, and it was still remarkably uh, robust modeling. So the, our reality is tracking what they predicted. And that study showed human population peaking and declining in some cases radically toward the center of this century, the current century. Peaking and declining. Um, okay, so that is pointing towards uh, a reverse of growth. We got a problem, <laughs> yes. And it's basically either we're going to uh, control our limiting growth, our coming in, in line with the limits of the planet, or we're going to say, hell no, we can burn all the fossil fuels, we can dig up all, we can fish up, and in that case, we end up with a, a population collapse. 
So if we want to stabilize an even off population. Population collapse due to? Well, <clears throat> combination. You, climate change, resource constrictions. Okay. And what happens if we really do start running out of some critical resources? Like water. Like fresh water, like uh, what happens if we kill off the oceans? Uh, we are sending the oceans into a hypoxic state that is without oxygen. Well, well documented that we are increasing the acidity and the reefs around the ocean are dying. Uh, I heard on a, a, a talk show uh, from KHPR yesterday that um, by 2050, 98 or 99 percent of all the reefs on Earth will be in a uh, state of bleach, uh, bleaching many years in a row. That kills them. 2050. By 2050, 98% will be dying from the bleaching effect. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef is collapsing now because it, they had three extreme bleaching events in a row. So what happens if we lose the fish in the ocean? Yeah, so your um, effort here, we have a, I think we have a, a picture of the three Nobel no nominees. Yes, there we go. And um, so now, what's the, let me, let me give the, the, the most important member of that, that trio, if I may, uh, the gentleman in the middle, uh, Dr. Herman Daly. He was a World Bank senior economist for eight years, um, quit in frustration uh, because the World Bank just did not get at the time. Oh, he was in charge of their sustainable, environmentally sustainable development department, but the world, the world Bank did not at that time get the fact that their investment was not sustainable. So um, we have a we have a um, slide of um, Dr. Dr. Daly, Dr. Daly yes. um, with a quote from him. There we go. There is something fundamentally wrong with treating the earth Earth as if it were a business in liquidation, and in his view, that's what we've we've been doing for decades, perhaps for that centuries. That really struck me. That is quite a powerful statement. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, he is credited as being the father of ecological economics. And again, for my part, ecological economics is what we need to shift to if we're going to survive. We should be requiring that it be taught in business schools, in undergraduate curricula, alongside of perhaps the standard growth economics. Now it's interesting, when you see the word economics in the paper or hear it on the radio, they're talking about neoclassical growth economics, but the neoclassical or the growth modifier has dropped out because after a hundred years of it being pretty much the only thing taught, it's like, why call it so many words? Let's just call it economics. So we assume it's become the paradigm. Everyone thinks we have to grow, grow forever. We got a problem, poverty, solution, growth. Not, not when you're running out of resources. And I don't mean just the hard resources, I mean the air resource. That is when we're overwhelming the, the waste sink of the atmosphere with CO2, heating up the planet, acidifying the oceans, etc. So um, this, um, the ecological economics is, is um, I, that's the same idea as natural capitalism, basically, it's not, it's, RMI, it's, and it's, I've, I've read that, or parts of it. They're related. They're, they're related. related. Um, but it's like, basically fixing the way we calculate it. No. 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 Okay. okay. And that's, that's, that's a, the distinction. That's the distinction. There, there are three kinds of economics I, I lecture about. One is the one we've got, which is dysfunctional. Okay. Um, it, in the model of the, of the economic system we have, the earth is not there. Um, then there's environmental economics, which says if you price natural capital in dollars or in pounds or euros and let the market, the invisible hand of the market work things out, everything will be fine. And I say that is called weak sustainability. It had, there are contradictions involved in that. Then there's ecological economics, which is known as strong sustainability, which says that you cannot apply a metric of money to everything. There are decisions that need to be made on qualitative basis, on ethical bases, and on ecological bases. How do you value the last herd of elephants? 
that's a good place for us to take a little pause. Hey, aloha, this is Andrew from Integrated Security Technologies uh, out here on behalf of PSA and your Cybersecurity Committee. Uh, I've got through Denver. I thought I'd give you a quick update on what we're doing heading into convention. I hope you all get down there in October. Um, if you haven't gotten into Tier Zero yet and worked on that material, I encourage you to do so. But I can tell you that our committee is moving on through Tiers uh, 1 through 5. And uh, we've got some great new tools to help you sort of gauge yourself and help you with your policies and your implementations uh, through tiers um, one and two. Uh, I'll be presenting that material down there at the uh, convention, so uh, please come on down. And um, in the meantime, if there's any particular issues that you're having, feel free to send them to the committee. Uh, we've got a great group of folks working there, and if you've got some people on your team that are more interested in this, uh, feel free to have them call us up, and uh, maybe they can uh, join our committee and help out a little bit. So thanks a lot. I look forward to seeing you there. Aloha. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawi Lucas. This is Think Tech Hawaii. With me today celebrating the solstice <laughs> is uh, Stuart Scott. And um, we were just talking about the economic theory of evolutionary, no. Ecological e economics. Ecological <laughs> economics. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> which could save us? Well, which, I think if we were if, if that was in place instead of what we've got, we would be in a much better position. So it's finding ways to um, make that message as loud as it possibly can be. Right, trying to get that into the university curricula, trying to get policymakers to go along with some of the major recommendations of, from ecological economics. Um, if we had more time, I'd give just a couple of them. Um, but. I'm, that's why I'm packaging the Pope with the founder of Ecological Economics with the Club of Rome for having created, created, sustained, and, and, and preaching about sustainability. So that's, a, that's, our path, that's our path forward. Yes. So you've got, uh, you gave me a, a couple of videos. Let's have a, a okay. look at the, um, at the first one. We'll go to the climate now. A slide that Sir Brian was referring to, and um, it's worth going through this a little bit. It, Jim Hayward made, made a point at a meeting recently that actually we should always start with this slide because there's a question of why are we doing this? Why are we doing this research? This is why. This is the uh, latest um, projections from the uh, International Panel of, Panel of Climate Change. And the alarming thing, which again Sir Brian highlighted, is that these two scenarios actually explicitly include negative emissions technologies. So there is geoengineering of the flavor of carbon dioxide removal in the best case scenarios. The very, very alarming thing for us is that we are on this path here. That's AR 8.5. We are slap bang on this trajectory. And that puts us in, in, a, in, a, in a very, very different place in our children's or our grandchildren's lifetime. Okay, well, that was a sobering little little clip there. If, if I can emphasize the point and simplify, the two lower lines were what is being talked about at the UN climate negotiations, but they're fictitious to a great extent because they are couched on the assumption of a technology that we don't yet have, and we're not even freely allowing uh, researchers to research. That is, we have to pull a huge amount of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to maintain this two degree goal, this two degree guideline, uh, or guardrail they call it. And we don't have that technology. So basically nations are disingenuously negotiating a treaty that they can't pull off because they don't have the technology on which they're negotiating that it might happen. And what he points to is that we are flat band, he says, on the high trajectory, which predicts four degrees of, of four degrees centigrade, about seven or eight degrees Fahrenheit, global average temperature rise by the end of this century, and it doesn't just stop there. That's catastrophic. That's catastrophic. So well, that's, that's also 70 years from now. Uh, but it doesn't go 99, boom. <laughs> it's, it's increasing. OK, all right. I'm, I'm trying <laughs> okay. to, OK. Right, all right. So, so we have to start somewhere. Yes. Uh, now, if we can show the second clip, uh, that, that'll help a bit. Okay. 
if we have a look at, uh, at what this temperature change actually is, is realised by, uh, by uh, 2090, this is what it looks like in a geographical pattern. Now, um, I would say that there's some, some very interesting things here. Look at the scale. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, results from the Hadley Centre model, which is a, a reputable climate model. Um, the ice cap's gone up by 20 degrees. Okay? Bear that in mind. New York's gone up by 8. Okay? The Amazon's gone up by 8. And the Amazon's obviously a sensitive area for... Um, because it's really acting as, as the lungs of the planet. It's often referred to because of its ability to fo uh, photosynthesize and take up carbon dioxide. So um, this, is, this is what the, that uh, 4 to 5 degree uh, temperature increase looks like. And this is where we're heading unless we do anything. So Stuart, are uh, there a lot of people having this discussion that we're having? about what actually needs to happen as you're going to these various events? What are you hearing? Not nearly enough people. Um, again, there's, there's the in front of the mainstream media uh, sound bites, which are all going along with the, what I call a fiction, that we can fix this problem um, by little tweaks here and there, and we can still consume oil. Oh, there's a carbon budget. We still have some oil we can consume without destable up. Blah. I think that's... Uh, disingenuous, like I say, because we st we have a carbon budget. If we had a way of vacuuming CO2 out of the air, which we don't, so people who have my view, there's an increasing number of people. Um, in fact, I think I saw an article this morning that eight out of ten people feel that we're on worldwide. From several eight thousand people who were polled worldwide, say that they believe we're on a catastrophic climate path. So it's, it's more urgent than governments are saying. And that's because for a government to admit that it is more serious than they have heretofore admitted means people will have to say, well, why don't you fix it? And the answer to that is because we fixing it is not, um, is not congruent with keeping growing economies, growing GDP, everybody growing. And if we're thinking in terms of two or four or six year election cycles, that's exactly. really uh, hard to do. Well, it's election what cycles. Coal, what sorry. about uh, carbon sequestration? I mean, is that uh, a, a myth? Well, that, that's, that's the geoengineering that we don't have down yet. It's, it's, an, it's a word, it's like clean coal. It's a very pretty word, but there is no scaled up working carbon sequestration project other than the Amazon or forests. But those are under, uh, under fire, uh, figuratively speaking and labor, literally speaking. Na nature knows how to do it. And if we reduce human population either, well, then nature will hopefully take, take over again and sequester carbon in natural processes. Okay, so these um, carbon, car carbon balancing, carbon credits. It's all, like I say, it's all part of this neoclassical economic ruse that we can fix everything if we, we can keep doing what we're doing, pumping out CO2 in, in New York and, and London, as long as we pay some other nation, nation to plant more trees. No. No? No. No, I'm sorry, because we're pumping out CO2 much faster than we can plant trees, and they take a while from planting before they're really absorbing a lot of carbon. And then the agreements that are there allow you to harvest them in 20 years and burn them as fuel. So it's really a shell game, I, the way wow. I see it. Um, and, um, and how about methane? That's the thing that okay, that's, we all have our own personal uh, nightmares. That's, 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 that's my mine. personal nightmare. Um, that, I call that the gun going off. Uh, it's going off in the Arctic, both on land and in the Arctic Sea. Um, there's a huge amount of methane that's stored in the Arctic tundra, the permafrost, and in the subsea mud that's been frozen also for years, for centuries. Um, methane, methane hydrates, methane clathrates, and because we are reducing the Arctic ice pack and it's peeling back year after year from the uh, land earlier and earlier. The mud in the very shallow 
East Siberian Arctic Shelf is warming just enough, it's still cold, but it's warming just enough that this methane hydrate is no longer stable and we're seeing a, an outbreak of venting of methane from the Arctic. And people say, well, why don't you catch it? It's a fuel, burn it. That's what they frack for. Why don't we catch it out of the Arctic? Because it's being emitted over far too wide an area in very hostile conditions. So it's, it's one that, to me, our, our fate may be sealed. But if not, then we have to do everything possible to reduce as we can our emitting of carbon dioxide and our emitting of methane from the fracking, which is improperly uh, um, vented into the atmosphere. Um, we, we have to do everything we can. And the current administration in Washington, D.C., is doing everything it can to go in the opposite direction. Um, the silver lining in, in what's going on in D.C., in my book, is that Donald Trump's administration is producing so much pushback by the rest of the world and by his own, the states in the, the United States, that he's actually pushing us faster than we would otherwise be going. Really. Well, that's awesome. Yes. Okay. Yes. We better. Uh... It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for everyone who's got it straight to organize and, and, and capitalize on that momentum. Well, in our last minute, um, what, what a great what a great place to to wind things up, Stuart. Um, what do you think? Oh, um, well, if I could replace Trump, I'd do it in a heartbeat. But um, like I said, there is there is some hope there. I, I would like to ask your listeners, your viewers, to go to NP4SD.org, Nobel Prize for Sustainable Development.org. Anyone in the world can do an endorsement of the prize, but there are millions of qualified nominators around the world who are unaware that they're qualified to nominate for the Peace Prize. A huge number of academic professors, emeritus professors, associate professors can nominate for the Peace Prize, but are unaware of it. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Kelly. Not cheery, <laughs> but wonderful. Do the best we can. <laughs>